Hello. Hi, everyone. Hey, it's a big crowd. Are you ready for my first slide? All right, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Let's see one more, one, one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So welcome to Convocation 2019. Convocation, it's, a, uh, it's the collective noun of eagles. It's also the beginning of the academic year. And uh, it's what I hope and expect will be the start of one of the most adventurous exciting parts of your education. And if we do our job right, um, this, you'll build on this experience for the rest of your life. And I'm Darren, I think most of you know me by now. I'm the, the president of the college and I'm an alumnus from the class of 1992. And like so many people I've run into, I, I mean, I love this place, right? I love it and the staff love it. And there's nothing better than now and the presence of students. We've been wicked busy over the whole summer, lots going on, but there is nothing like the return of students. So welcome, welcome back everyone. Yeah. Um, I've got three things to cover in my few minutes and actually let's um, call it what it is. It's gonna be more than a few minutes. You should be prepared for 25 minutes, um, but don't, don't fret, it, uh, there are visuals to go with that. Uh, but then I'm going to introduce Nishad, a graduate from the class of 05 and really kind of the focus of the experience. So first I'm going to, um, a discussion of tribute, respect, and partnership, number one here. Um, a year ago at this time I made mention that the college was going to put our collective shoulder behind three broad top topics. First, we're going to discuss the future of our faculty and curriculum because of demographics, we will see a lot of older faculty members retiring and a lot of new faculty members coming in. How as a community do we want to manage that? Second, we were going to take on this question of persistence and retention. How can we better provide so that all students um, with the guidance and foundation from the college can persist on to graduation. And third, we wanted to understand and approve upon question of diversity, equity, and inclusion of staff, faculty, and students. First year students have been a part of that during the orientation. There is a working group being led by Dave Feldman, a faculty member here, and there will be opportunities to engage on diversity, equity, inclusion throughout the year and for this foreseeable future. There's no doubt we have loads and loads of work to do on the DEI front, but part of that work involves the Wabanaki people, past and present, whose lands we are currently on. Um, we need to recognize the tribal communities who called Mount Desert Island, Pessamcook, home. This is a shot from the Abbey Museum's exhibit, People of the Dawn Land. And as many of you know, Today, the indigenous communities of Maine are called Wabanaki, but they refer to themselves as Jawapanahiak, and I practiced that all night long, Jawapahaniak, um, which means people from the land where the sun rises. It's the root of the word Wabanaki. And according to tribal documents, there are 8,587 Wabanaki people in the state of Maine. 1,240 members of the Aroostook Band of Micmac, 1,700 members of the Holton Band of Maliseet, 3,369 members of the Passamaquoddy Nation, and 2,278 members of the Penobscot Nation. I want to acknowledge their presence here today, but I want to make this acknowledgement being fully aware of the continual violations of water, territorial rights, sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. And I think we as a community need to work if we're called upon and needed to help the Wabanaki address those issues. And that's, that's the partnership piece here. Here's a different way to capture the outline of Pesham Cook. I asked Gordon furiously this morning, Gordon, send me a great map of MDI. And then I found this one late at night and I love the, the LIDAR image 
Um, Bar Harbor, which you see up there in the northeast, was called um, Moneskatik, which means um, place of clams or clam digging place. But I think we're going to need to ask Chris Peterson if that name is still viable. It might be better called place of green crabs. We're not quite sure yet. Um, MDI is no doubt one of the most remarkable places on the planet because of this human history and because of the beauty. And in my eyes, one of the, one of the best ways that we can understand, respect, and pay tribute to the people who lived here is to first to press your mind and stretch your understanding of what native peoples have gone through. What does indigeneity mean? What is the history, that very violent, difficult history of Wabanaki? But it's also important to get out and to know the lands. Um, there is a portal for doing this. It's right across the street. Actually, that's not true. It's right, this marker is right in front of the Door Museum. Consider it as a portal to Acadia National Park and the rest of Mount Desert Island and to the hundreds of miles of trails and carriage trails, a way to understand the native lands of the people who lived here. That's number one. Number two, second, convocation is a time to remember someone. Um, Les Brewer was one of two founding board members of the College of the Atlantic, and he died on October. August 23rd of this year. Uh, he was 97 years old and an active participant in this college up until almost the very, actually two days before he died, he was asking us about our capital campaign and how things were going. He lived a long, fruitful, very productive life. Um, today, I would like to call for a moment of silence and, and memory of Les, if you would. Thank you. you. You see the portrait on the wall over there? Yeah, that's, that's Ed Kelber. He's uh, our founding president. I've commissioned Rock Kaivano, who's the artist of that, to paint a new, a new portrait of Les, a portrait of Father Jim Gower, who is the other founding trustee, and of Ann Peach, who was the first chief operating officer and everything else at this college. <laughs> All right, now on to the last part, and admittedly the more lengthy part, but I think you'll, you'll like it, I hope. Um, so third, I wanted to consider a little bit about who we are. Um, I've always talked about CUA as having this special sauce, and so I wanted to dig in a little bit about what the CUA special sauce is all about. And I landed on this idea through two avenues. Uh, first, just two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to take my own daughter off to college. This is me, obviously, and my daughter Maggie. And you all are going to be tired of me mentioning Maggie and her college and how that went. But it was a real learning experience, not only for her, but for, for me as well. Um, she went to a school, a great school. It seems like a great match for Maggie. Really excited for her two weeks going. But I came back saying, wow, we do stuff really different. <laughs> <laughs> really, really differently here. And obviously I knew that going in, but it was a learning experience to figure that out. The second route and the second um, um, way I came about this idea is that um, I wanted to, I, I, two people have joined the staff recently. And in those first discussions, <coughs> I've said to myself, okay, this, these are the way that faculty or staff, students, the whole college is a little bit different. And before I go into the, the numbers um, here, because um, what's really going to happen is I'm going to give you 22 <laughs> examples. It was originally a top 10 list, the top 10 list of da 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 da. And I kept going through my photographic database, and I was like, I've got to include that one. I've got to include that one. But I, they will, when, once they start running, you'll, you'll, you'll feel comfortable. But uh, anyway, the, the new staff who I wanted to present this to are, are um, a number of them. So last year, we celebrated convocation on the 5th of September. Um, and there are a bunch of people that joined us since then. Now, Carrie Sands joined us on the 4th of September. Is Carrie here? Hi, Carrie. Yeah. Can you stand up, Carrie? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
<laughs> so Carrie works with the Sustainable Business Program and our food program. I may have missed you last year, is what I'm here to say. If I didn't say it on September 5th, I wanted to recognize you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Ivy Enoch. <laughs> Ivy joined us. Yeah. <laughs> you can stand up, too. Like, yeah. Ivy joined us as an admission. <laughs> She's an admissions counselor. She started on September 10th of last year. She's an alum. She's a member of the Black Fly Runners, which I'll explain about later. Um, Don Bryce joined us on November 30th. Is Don here? He's the night watchman. He's probably sleeping now, so he can be on for, um, for, for later on. Laura Berry, is Laura here? Okay, Laura is also an alum. Uh, she works with the Community Energy Center. She started on June 5th. July 1, John Pergolini. Is John here? John had to go to Portland today. John is also an alum, and he is in charge of buildings and, er, sorry, not Miller. No, he, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's in charge of grounds. Um, I've got a great slide later. Um, how about Sydney White? Is Sid Sydney, Sydney, Sydney White. Not City, Sydney White. She's in the, in the admissions department. She started August 12th. Deb DeForest, could you stand up, please, Deb? Deb is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. She says executive assistant to president or something like that. Um, <laughs> September 1, two people joined us. Blake Cass is the associate director of the Writing Center. Blake. And will you talk to Blake about this, please? Um, and then finally, Maureen Harrigan. Is Maureen here? Hey, Maureen. Yeah. <laughs> Maureen's the new Dean of Administration. And so you all, not all of you because some are alums, but consider this like a primer on those intangible things that you kind of just need to experience. Are you ready? Are you ready to go through them now, right? Number 22. So, number 22, we have a very different perspective on how we share the campus with other critters. Have you seen this sign before, right? right? I love this in the context of John Pergolini. Like, you know, hey, other campuses at Furman, they would have bombed the hell out of this little wasp nest. I can guarantee it. I love that we share the grounds with others. See, it's going quickly now, right? Num <laughs> number 21, um, graduation, right? Graduation at COA is something very, very special. This is uh, me and the then board chair, Will Thorndike, some woman that wandered off the street. <laughs> and uh, no, it's Nancy Andrews, who is the grand marshal of the day. And Hanif willis Abdurraqib the poet and commencement speaker at the time. Graduation, am I right? Those have, it's like there's something really special about it and it's not just the, the f chocolate fondue and strawberries, but mark, mark your date um, for that, please. Number 20, um, I mentioned Will Thorndike before. That is Will in the far right. We are the only college where the president is the, um, the coach of the running squad and the board chairman is an active member. Uh, we take athletics very seriously here. <laughs> very seriously, no more serious than our COA Black Fly running crew. Um, we've just been ranked in New England very high and um, we take it very, very seriously. No, serious. As a place to run, on the East Coast at least, not West Coast, East Coast, better, better than anywhere. And um, so why we're on the topic of trustees, this is a serious one. I tried to like toggle back and forth between like funny and serious. Thir 19 is a serious one. So um, when I asked trustees like, what do you like most about the college? They don't say like, I love the endowment, huge endowment, buildings are beautiful, I love the prestige. What they say for, first and foremost is they love the students. Um, if you ask trustees, they'll tell you there is no better way to understand the college than to experience the senior project talks and performances that happen 
on Friday before graduation. Um, this is Isabel Scheide and her uh, dance and movement performance, but last year included this list. And at one point I had this memorized, but I've since forgot, so I'm gonna read it. Rose McNally from right here in Bar Harbor, she did a project entitled Wound-Induced Polyploidy and Integrin Hippo Signaling. Rose is now a research scientist at the MDI Biolab. It would also include Moni from Lebanon and body autonomy and domestic violence, an artistic approach for women in Syrian refugee settlements. Moni is off doing her Thomas J. Watson fellowship, looking at domestic violence all over the world. Jo Lee, originally from Hong Kong, her project was a student's perspective on COA housing design, and Jo Lee is working for Opal, the architectural firm in Belfast. Colin from Western Maine and his project with the hard to memorize title, a photographic exploration of cyanotype and Van Dyke Brown printing methods. Colin was working for High Peaks Alliance last, I knew. And um, then finally, you'd know Siobhan from San Francisco and her, her thesis, Alternative versus Traditional Veterinary Care in Southern Chile. And Siobhan is doing her DVM out at UC Davis. So the Wednesday before graduation, Months from now, put that on your calendars. You've got to be there. All right, now back to the less serious ones, like number, oh no, this is, this is pretty serious too. Um, I also was thinking a lot about art. And um, I think it's fair to say that at COA, we take art very seriously, but we probe it in ways that aren't always common among many colleges and universities. We're, um, we always love to ask, um, okay, when you say we must bring the arts and sciences together, like, what does that really mean? It's so, it's a meme today. It's out there all the time. I think we ask and we probe, what does that really mean? We take it very seriously here. Um, number 17, Sarah Hall couldn't be here. I am really wish she could have been here, but there's Sarah Hall on the left. We have a relationship with a unit in the national park system in Acadia National Park that I think is unparalleled and stronger than anywhere else. Number 15, you remember this just a few days ago, first, first year students, right? This was at the beginning of the outdoor orientation program. Um, loads of colleges have these outdoor orientation programs. Like we know that, we're not, we're not unique, in that re unique in that respect. But when I heard Nick give this talk, my, like, my, my jaw went slack. It was really beautiful. This is, this is what he had to say. This is what OOPS offers. Connection to the landscape, connection with our fellow humans, connection to the earth itself. These are not intellectual pursuits, but profoundly visceral and embodied. OOPS allows us to open up to the natural world around us. With this, the world becomes alive and deep truths avail themselves. The connection between all things, the fundamental mystery of being, the eternity in a moment of silence, oops, allows us to practice the art of being human. Further, these trips are microcosms of the entire human and human ecological experience. They touch on all aspects of life, physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual. They teach us that whether it be in a small tent or on a small planet, we truly are all in this together. When he said that, I was like, whoa. Like, I can promise you my daughter's orientation session did not begin with that paragraph. Um, I thought it was beautiful and a great, great reflection of us. Um, <laughs> Mount COA, like, right? Uh, <laughs> has everyone, anyone said, what the heck is that thing out there, right? Like, um, it's 150 cubic yards of soil, right, that we had to scrape away from the building project up here in the north and deposit down there. And then when we're all ready, we're going to sift all of it. And all of you will be out there with little <laughs> sifters like this. So we bring the soil back up and backfill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that in and of itself is unique. But even better, Suzanne Morse, Suzanne here. Okay, Suzanne came into my class the other day, and, or into my office the other day, and she said, you're not moving the pile of dirt, right? Because we are structuring 
the weed ecology class around the mountain of dirt in the front yard. And I was like, yes, absolutely we are. <laughs> Um, we make the best of strange situations, let's just say. Um, back on the North Lawn, um, we embrace winter as a season. Well, not all of us, but many of us embrace winter. I just love, love this picture when the North Lawn turns into skating. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, number 13, we experiment and we improvise. We are scrappier than any other college in the country. In the US News World Report rankings, number one in scrappiness. <laughs> number one. Number 12, we challenge ourselves with forks. Ah, ah thank you, Ned. Number 12, we challenge ourselves with forks. Has everyone met these forks, right, that you go in and they, they break, right? Um, no, but kidding aside, I put this up here because we're passionate about discarded resources. As far as I can tell, there's not a lot of passion out there elsewhere. Here, we're passionate about it. We know we've got loads of work to do, but we're ready to take it on. And that, that hit me. That really hit me. Number 11. Um, we have a unique ability to touch and learn from our history. Does everyone recognize um, the guy on the far right? Yeah. So this is John Mitchell, Les Clark in the middle, and, and Miller Doherty. And when I learn, I say we learn that Millard should never sport a mustache without other <laughs> facial hair. Um, but no, seriously, we touch... We get to touch our past, and Bill Carpenter last year gave an entire class on the history of the college, which was just fantastic, which we recorded and we will share. And this is an interview he had with Alexandra Conover Bennett from um, uh, the class of 1977. Okay, number 10. I think you're going to like this one, too. Does anyone recognize this, this guy? Huh? Who is it? Jacques Cousteau, right? So for the older people in the audience like myself, um, for in terms of marine science, right? Jacques Cousteau, he was like the man of ocean science. Uh, and not to take anything away from what he did, because he did a lot of great stuff, but let me tell you, there's a new face to ocean science. And it is that. How badass is that photo, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is thanks to Sean Todd. Um, I just, when I saw that, I was like, whoa, that is fantastic. And it's an indication to all of us that our campus does not stop at 38 acres here. It extends way, way out into the ocean, 11 miles to Great Duck and 25 miles to Mount Desert Rock. And this, of course, is uh, Mount Desert Rock. So know that. Um, where am I? Okay. Um, in terms of also knowing where your campus goes, consider Beach Hill Farm. Uh, and also consider Peggy Rockefeller Farm. We don't just have two islands, we have 200 plus acre farms that are absolutely essential to how we do things here. Loads of other colleges have farms. Ours is intimately connected to the curriculum, to our food system, and to the way we do things. And where is Courtney, is she here? Courtney, um, I am hereby reminding all of you that on Monday, September 23rd, at Peggy Rockefeller Farm, we will have Farm Day beginning at 4 p.m., right? So you're all welcome to come and get a taste of what, uh, get, a, get, get a taste of what the farms are like. Uh, number seven. Did I miss one? Oh, sorry. Number eight, <laughs> number eight, we take our food really, really seriously, right? Really seriously. It begins on the, out on the farms. 
It comes back to here with Lisa and Ken and Tab. Uh, it goes back to all the campus housing and what you do there. Food is an essential ingredient of that panache that, that makes COA what it is, right? Um, and part of that gets back to number seven, take a break. Okay, my wife said I shouldn't say this, but take a break is the best, the best place to gather and consume food together in the country in terms of higher education. There is no second, right? It really is. It is. Karen, my wife, who you'll meet later if you haven't met her, said like, you know, you should really back off on that. It seems like you're going a little bit, but I, I think it's, I think it's true. And when, um, for the new students here, when we were thinking and, you know, originally going back to the, um, imagining the new building, uh, there was at one point an idea, well, maybe we could move Tab over to that new building. And there was like revolt, like whatever you do, do not mess tab up, um, which I think was the right thing to do. Number six, part of what makes tab great is that we're, there are loads of kids there, like Jack Grizzly here, um, and Willow, that's right, and Willow and back. And um, later on, you might get to meet Ezra too, which is great, but I think kids make this college remarkable. The more kids, the better. We have so much, so much we can learn from little kids, which brings me to number five, is that here in a transdisciplinary environment, the idea is we can learn from everyone. We can learn physics and chemistry and design and planning, not just from PhDs, but from stonemasons. And the guy second to the left is a stonemason that worked on us, or worked with us on the, on the hidden garden right there. And um, that brings us to number four is the campus. The campus is a laboratory. It's not a museum specimen, not that there's anything wrong with museums. Maybe consider it like a kid's museum where you can touch and play with everything. But it is a laboratory, and this was part of the experiment, as was this. And you will see this come um, er late February, early March, when we, about 50 of these will appear on some of the maple trees throughout the campus, and uh, we will use them to boil our own sap, which brings me to number three. Um, we love to ferment things, like more than any other college. Again, fermentation is really good. And so part of the, um, the batch from last year's um, maple syrup, like um, Reuben, this is Reuben Hudson on the right, and he poured it out and this big blob came out. And the first thing people said was, well, we can make mead out of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's make meat out of it. So we love to ferment things. Um, we're almost there, as you can see. Uh, number two, any idea what those dots might rec represent? Who said that? How did you know that? <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I didn't think anyone was going to get that. <laughs> it took me a long time to put these little dots on the map. Let me just, let me just tell you. Um, 55 countries, we represent 350 students here total from 55 countries. That's extraordinary. Now, we just ranked number three in terms of the highest percentage of international students, and that's, that's all right, but um, I, think it's, I think it's much more than that because when you have a curriculum like ours and a, you have a size of a community like ours, when there are students from 55 countries and about 37 states, that makes for something really, really special. Where are you? Where's, where? From where? Colorado, there you are, see? There you are. Um, is Evi Tong here? Okay, Evi Tong is from Kiribati in the middle of Micronesia. He is, um, he's that one way, way, I kind of had to approximate between New Zealand and Hawaii. Um, but, and then, uh, ready for number one? Drumroll, please. Yeah, the bar island swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, um, we do orientation like no one else. That's true. That's totally true. But the point is, I think what we do with um, orientation is we ask, and for your four years here, we ask 
that you really challenge yourself intellectually, socially, and physically. And that begins um, at 3.30 when all of you are welcome back here. Anyone who wants to yet to find a place, and Darren, I think, really highlighted this in his 22 images. Um, a place that exemplifies and thrives on nonlinear teaching and, and learning so effectively to create a better future and a better tomorrow. So you might all think now, well, I know that already. That's why I came to COA. Why, you don't need to really tell me this. Um, so I do want to tell you one thing, but I, I do want to say that is why I consider it a privilege to share this very important day with you. Um, because I know that I'm in front of a group of students uh, that are already determined to create a better tomorrow. And a group of individuals that would no doubt will have a lasting impact on any community or society that you choose to be part of. So it's a privilege to be here in front of you. And you're right, ever since Sarah Luke asked me to um, be here today, I've been thinking about what am I going to tell you that you don't know already or that you can't just Google. Even the map that Darren just put up, you knew immediately what that meant. So. Um, so what am I going to tell you? Well, I don't actually have anything that I wanted to tell you, but I do want to give you a small reminder of one thing. And I want to remind you of the power that you have at your fingertips that I didn't have uh, when I was a student here. When I was a student here, we actually had to get up and go to the library and find information, me and many generations before me. In my I think in my second or third year, I did buy a laptop, and it said it has wireless internet capabilities. And it blew my mind when Sean Murphy told me that that means you could sit out in the lawn and check your email. And this was only 18 years ago. And to me, that's a pretty short time. Um, just to put into context how far we've come as a society, and just not in the US, but around the world. Um, growing up in Sri Lanka, I didn't have electricity until I was about eight years old. And when I came to COA, I actually sent letters to my parents because it was way too expensive to call them. And now I just can't stop my mother from sending me WhatsApp messages all the time. <laughs> so just in 18 years. And I remember arriving in the US for the first time. It was an evening um, at the Boston Logan Airport. And I was eager and excited. Um, came out of the immigration and realized I missed the bus to Con the Concord bus to Bangor. Um, and I didn't have a way to look up the bus schedule, so I didn't know when the next bus was going to be. And I also didn't have a way to call the person who was coming to pick me up that I wasn't going to make it. So whoever that person is ended up coming and probably left after some time of waiting. So I just had to wait at the airport, um, staring at the ceiling. There was no Netflix to watch and um, looking out of the door to make sure that I wasn't going to miss the next bus and spend the night until I caught the bus next morning. And when I got here, it took about a whole other week before I could actually reach my parents and tell them that, that I arrived safely. It also took them about 10 more years so they could use Google to figure out what human ecology meant. <laughs> and as you can imagine, they're still confused, but... Um, but I want to remind you that, that compared to every generation before you, you grew up armed with this incredible set of tools to learn about the world and to share your views and values about the world with billions of people in a matter of seconds. That's something many generations didn't have before you. Think about it, all the emperors and the conquerors that you hear about in, in human civilization for hundreds of thousands of years didn't have that power that you have with you right now. So we take it for granted, right? But I want to remind you that, that this using, the, this power can be used for real change. And that's perhaps the only thing that I want to tell you is that using this power you have for real change is way more important now than it has ever been because we're seeing how these tools are also being used to spread, spread messages of hate and lies to oppress communities, to diminish people that may not look like you, um, to propagate unfounded facts. And misinformation, it's reduced the value of my own research, 
and thousands of other people, other scientists and policymakers working really hard to show that how humans are changing the world around us. Misinformation has led certain communities to believe that that's not true. It's been told to some people that we are not destroying our oceans. That it's, not told, it's told to some communities that their rights for clean water are not being taken away. So because of these uninformed, misled masses that continue to remain ignorant, um, the threats of climate change and pollution, they've magnified in some communities to points of no return. Some of our field work that we do around Sri Lanka, um, some of the reef ecosystems that I grew up with, we don't see them anymore, it's not there. So it's heartbreaking to witness these impacts on a daily basis but to know that, it's even more heartbreaking to know that we can change that and we can reverse that just by spreading messages of truth and facts. So I want to remind you that the need for using this power you have at your fingertips to connect communities, to be with communities, to build societies, to have real impact on places that you feel close to that need is ever more critical. And I cannot think of a better place than COA for you to be trained to do that. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you and welcome to the family again. And I look forward to seeing all of you do that. Thank you. Thank you, Nishad, that was beautiful and a great way to, to start the year. And with that, um, like I said, to start the convocation is the official opening of the academic year. And I am hereby, if I had a gavel, I guess I'd pound it, uh, opening the 2019-2020 academic year at COA. And if you're interested and excited about swimming, or even if you're just interested, not excited, you need to be here at 3.30 um, for the safety meeting because at four o'clock we begin the Bar Island swim. Then there will be uh, a pic barbecue picnic afterward and music in the evening. It's a great, great day. The sun is out. Welcome to COA. Thank <laughs> you.